This film, European Spiritual Masters, is part of the project Blueprints for Awakening, which originally started in 1993 while I was living with my spiritual master, Papaji, in India. I got a spontaneous inner message suggesting to film the great Indian masters, and I started those interviews in 2000 while I was on a year's personal retreat at the holy mountain Arunachala. That film, Blueprints for Awakening, has touched many through the beautiful aura of the masters. In the years that followed, I had the opportunity to dialogue with a variety of European masters, some being friends and others just appeared in my life most of them having a deep respect for the great Indian sage Sri Ramana Mahashi, on whom the questions from the Blueprints project are based. I continued the Indian Master Films format by asking the same 12 questions to each European Master, questions that cover the main issues on a spiritual seeker's journey. The teachings in the film cover a spectrum of spiritual positions. Some masters talk from the absolute position of truth without any compromise. Some offer contradictory teachings that combine the absolute with the relative, encouraging practice. There is a quality which comes through in the film the original quality which I wanted to catch, which is the energy, the light, and the aura of the masters. When you watch the film, you're watching truth being spoken. This film offers us a dramatically revolutionary view of our lives by showing us that the happiness we so desire is in truth our original nature. There is the fundamental question, who am I? Who are you? I'm no one. Um, the, I have to say uh, from the very beginning that I'm not an enlightened person. So who am I? No one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have all the spiritually correct answers to that question. And now I don't anymore bother with the answer and it feels really good a good feeling you know right. it's uh, because it's just the happiness of this moment and you know no idea simply no idea of what I am or what I'm not there's a simple total absence of any idea of what I am or what I'm not that I am 
but this is not an answer to anything. When we ask ourselves the question, what am I, or who am I, or when we just speak the word, or think I, we refer to something. I is the name that we give to that which is most intimately known. Of course, there is a process of, of asking myself, who am I? This question just goes nowhere, you know. It turns the direction to, to the source of what I am. It goes to the, to the center from where everything is seen. And there nothing is found, you know. It just goes to the, to the emptiness. I'm consciousness. I'm that which is hearing these words right this moment. And so are you. On that which I am, there is very little that can be said other than I am, and I am this consciousness. There is a place where you cannot actually answer the question except to smile or to do the next thing that you're going to do, or say the next thing that you're going to say. It comes out of nowhere. Shima, 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 Ya. Shima, 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 Ya. Shima, 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 Shima. Many seekers are looking for enlightenment as if it is an experience. What is enlightenment? Buddha's enlightenment. Ramana Maharshi's enlightenment. And simply because Ramana had his, therefore the seeker may think this is what I should work towards, which is therefore called practice, or, I shouldn't work towards, but I should wait for grace. I've never met her. And then grace will come, and then that will change my life. There is no such thing as personal enlightenment. Enlightenment is simply the end of the person. The problem for the seeker is that they think they have to find something else. So they look for states, um, they look for states of peace or, or whatever they think enlightenment is. For most seekers, uh, the, the belief is that the enlightenment is like a spiritual lottery. If they win it, then their whole life will then be free of suffering and everything will be wonderful and everybody will love them and all this sort of nonsense. <laughs> But you would see that what you're saying is quite controversial because 99% of the people would perhaps find it difficult to agree with you. No, they wouldn't find it difficult. They would find it impossible. <laughs> From the point of view of the individual, to say that there is no such thing as individuality is impossible to grasp. Right. And right. that is what awakening is. It's absolutely impossible for an individual to grasp this. <clears throat> enlightenment is to see that that what is self is ever enlightened and that what is not the self will never be enlightened and then to be that void itself. And then there is no before and no after in it. The simple dropping out of time or no time, the simple dropping of that me, which was simply a false self. And this dropping is an absolute dropping of any sense of existence. And this is not something big or something small, this is simply a little aha. Nothing special. It's like a split second, everything is done. So when you say aha, you mean it's like a, a recognition? Yeah, it's like a more recognition than a realization. It's a recognition of that, that, that what you are is ever realized. and cannot get more realized than it already is. Enlightenment. 
enlightenment really refers to that self-awareness wherein one discovers I'm not merely the body, nor the thinking, nor the conditioning, nor the apparent identity that arises as a person, but that I am that in whose presence all that appears as manifestation, as life, as time, relationship, space, all of this is perceived in me. But myself cannot be perceived directly or phenomenally, because I have no form, I have no lasting form apparent form, but the form itself is also appearing in me. And when that understanding has really settled or happened uh, to itself, that is ordinarily referred to as awakening, liberation, enlightenment. What is enlightenment is an outcome of a liberated mind. It is not to figure out what enlightenment is like, how it looks like, how it should be like. And there is the tendency to figure it out, to ask this question, what is enlightenment? So that you may can compare, or is it the same with me? And then you come to this conclusion, oh yes, I'm enlightened. I have seen that a lot. <laughs> yeah. What is important is to make a distinction between a first glimpse of our true nature and the subsequent establishment process that leads to our abiding knowingly as this presence. So the first and glimpse of our true nature could be called enlightenment because it is a very profound uh, experience that brings about a 180 degree shift. I maintain that the early thoughts always, always the strongest because of the contrast between the place you, you were in and the place that you're thrown into. If that's really a great leap, then you really feel well, this is an incredible experience. And then, but as you go on working on yourself or with other people, or with a teacher, you get nearer and nearer. So then the, the jump into the same sort of space doesn't feel so grandiose as it did the first time. People have uh, certain ideas of how enlightenment shows and of course Westerners you know when we look at the <clears throat> collective coloring of the idea of enlightenment Westerners have um, of course in their minds the um, archetype of, of, of the holy and then they link certain um, attributes to this archetype of the holy, but enlightenment is much more, you know, undefinable. It cannot be, it's unpredictable. It's a word. And this word is one of those words which has a strong emotive energy in it. And when I was younger, it had the effect of completely changing my life. And I saw it as a kind of solution to my situation. And I would say that later, um, it became a difficult word. And in a way was holding me in an idea that I could get something, and if I, if I could get something, then it was also holding me in this idea that I was a somebody who could get something. So then I started to realize that this thing that I could achieve called enlightenment was already there, had always been there. So all my striving for all those years to come to enlightenment, which felt like you know, Mount Everest or something, the summit of Mount Everest, 
I suddenly realized that this searching for enlightenment had been with no point. Are there any qualifications for enlightenment? And is practice necessary? And if yes, what form of practice do you advise? The knowing of our own being is veiled. The knowing of our own being as unlimited, unlocated presence is, is veiled. So we set out as this apparent entity into the apparent world of objects, relationships, looking for the happiness that was lost when we seemed to cease to know our own being. And um, most of us try all the conventional means in the world. Sooner or later, our search in the world ends. And it dawns on us, who, who is this one that is in search? Maybe I should question this one that I have considered myself to be and that has been out in the world searching for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So it is, it is the interest in finding out who this one is that is the prerequisite. What is the, what is the, motor, the fuel behind that? It is the search for happiness. Instead of searching for happiness in the objects of the world, sooner or later they fail us. And the search, as it were, turns around. We face this one, this apparent one who is in search for exactly the same reason that we were previously searching in the world. We want happiness. I want to say life itself can make you ready. It does not necessarily mean that you have to be official so on the path, you understand? Right. But uh, you bring, everybody brings with itself and life itself, you know, this play of Lila or living in a wrong vision, this samsara, I say samsara is not against truth, you know. I call it the sense stick of samsara, why you get hit? Because you are in a wrong vision, because you desire for something unnatural, that's why you bound to suffer, so these are the sense stick. Is practice necessary? Yes, practice, my God, if you don't, if you want to wake up, my God, get the message of meditation, you know. People think it is such a big thing, it is such a easy scientific device, special for lazy people, you know, and can even enjoy, isn't it? Nature, it is the greatest invitation for awakening, you know, it is so, your nature, which is your nature you try to become, it is so nicely reflected in nature, silence, peace, and humor, the animals, you know, make you smile, you know, even if you're miserable, dog by does make you smile, isn't it? It's so powerful, it has such a power, you know, and it is the, the, the greatest bridge to come to know love, unconditional love, you understand? Humans are nuisance, it's very difficult, isn't it? But nature is such an invitation, you know, and in a sense, how you can resist, isn't it? Yeah. There are those who identify with practice. The self is wrapped around practice. The I and the me and the my is caught up in practice. The practice, instead of being a force for liberation, becomes a new imprisonment. Better to drop it. Trapped in practice, practice, practice. The vulnerable edge in the Buddhist tradition. There are those who are equally foolish, equally unclear. 
And they will say, practice is all, is the doer, is effort, is trying to get somewhere, and if you're sitting on the cushion, you're trying to get somewhere to get something. And you can't get to that which you already are. Clinging to practice is severely problematic. Rejection of practice is equally problematic. Ramana said, self-inquiry is the most direct route to realizing the self. What do you say about self-inquiry and how to conduct self-inquiry? It is so valuable to come to know whom I am. For me, as a meditator, as a meditator, <clears throat> when I hear it on the path, that I should ask myself whom I am. I was not interested. Only if I came to Punjaji, everybody who am I, who am I, who am I, okay, Dolano, then <laughs> if everybody asks who am I, let's find out who am I, okay, <laughs> what to do, isn't it? So when I came to know who am I, I was so surprised. It made all the difference. You know, a meditator can't really come to know who am I. You know, there is still this love affair, you know, with existence, you understand? Fundamentally, self-inquiry is suggesting this change, you know. It's suggesting, instead of looking out into the world, it's suggesting 180 degree turn to looking at the inner world. So the, the, the fundamental idea of self-inquiry, as the words suggest, is to inquire about the self, to inquire you know, what is really going on inside, so that we come to really know ourselves. We know our uh, structural pattern, the patterns of our mind. Um, we come to know um, our emotional responses to certain situations. We come fam become very familiar with the workings of the mind, the body-mind connection, and our, if you like, our relationship with the body-mind connection. And all of this is, if you like, the beginning of self-inquiry. Ramana Mahashi makes a very specific suggestion and his specific suggestion, which is in his small teaching booklet, which is called Who Am I? And he suggests a very simple and very exact way of conducting self-inquiry, which is to investigate to whom the thoughts arise. So, okay, you, you, you're doing your awareness practice, you're looking at yourself constantly, you're looking inside, you become aware of lots of thoughts arising. And normally, we get very attached to those thoughts very easily. And he's suggesting, look at those thoughts and go back to the source of the thoughts. Don't care about the thoughts. Don't give any energy to the thoughts. Give the energy to find out to whom are those thoughts arising. And so, you, you first look and you ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts arise? And the answer is to me, because I'm identified with being a separate somebody. And then I ask, who is this me? Or who am I? I'm in total agreement with Ramana's words. I use sometimes this example like, it is the most unsparing tool, instrument, practice, if you may say, for blowing the cover and exposing that the ego 
the feeling of I, based upon the idea that I am the body-mind, is a complete fake. I say it is as quick as looking in the mirror and seeing one's reflection. The mirror doesn't give an opinion. It doesn't tell you, please wait, I'm too busy. It's always available. And I would somehow liken the inquiry to that type of effectiveness. And the experience that I've had is that um, if people intensely ask these questions, these two questions, in exactly in the way that Ramana suggests in his little booklet, then many people have had a profound effect from these two questions. This who am I has become a kind of famous catchphrase. But basically, you're, you're then investigating who exactly is this me that you, we're so identified with. And when you ask this second question, you find yourself being taken deeper and deeper inside. And the answer to that second question is not an answer. So this, this question leads you into silence, if you like. It leads you into the mystery of the self. This question, who am I, uh, has no limits and can just pop up and unfold into uh, wholeness, into everything. It is definitely possible that this question just penetrates every layer of um, illusion of dust that has settled internally and goes right through into through everything. The best spiritual practice is the self-inquiry, is to investigate not who am I, but rather what am I. How do I know that this consciousness I know to be, I know I am, that which is hearing these words in this moment, how do I know that this consciousness is personal, limited in time, in space, dependent upon this body or, or this, this limited body or this limited mind. How do I know? What's the evidence? Because most of us believe that there is a strong evidence in support of this belief. But as we begin to investigate, we feel that there is absolutely none. The important element of the self-inquiry is not the question, what am I, being asked, but rather the listening to the answer. So it could be said that the question, what am I, it would be enough to ask, to ask it once, and then to listen to the answer. And then our, our life, in all its details, our daily life, then becomes the listening to the answer, you see. Om asatoma satgamaya tamasoma jyotirgamaya mrityoma amritam gamaya Om asatoma satgamaya tamasoma jyotirgamaya when Ramana was asked, when will the realization of the self be gained? He replied, when the world, which is what is seen, has been removed. There will be realization of the self, which is the seer. What is the true understanding of the world? and how to remove the world? Well, you can remove the world at any moment. 
you can just drop it. It's just a movie. It's just a fascinating movie, or many billions of movies fall into acting with each other. You know, I am reminded of a Zen story about a master saying to his disciples, well, if the sun is coming up, who can make the sun go down? And one of the guys got up and he pulled the blind down. Beautiful answer. Sun disappeared. Sun got down. <laughs> so it's only there as long as you participate in it in some way, as long as you enter it. But if you stop participating in it and you find a place you can go to when you're not participating, you're not dependent on it in the sense that most people are, that if they don't participate in the world, they feel they don't exist. If you can find a nice isolation place that's independent of the world, then the world is spits. Well, what Ramana meant when he used the term world, he meant the mind, because the world and the mind, to begin with, are just two words for the same. Um, when the mind is removed, the world collapses and the fall into the absolute, which is also the fall into the unknown, happens naturally. Then the world comes back which is not the mind, because of course there is also something that we can call world, which is not the mind, which is the, the suchness of a tree, the suchness of everything that, that appears. So there is something which is considered to be located in here, which, is, which knows, or which is considered to know or see. And then the world is made out of something else, a different substance called matter. We give it a name. It is what consciousness is not. When we explore deeply, and this is what is meant by self-inquiry, when we deeply explore the nature of our experience, we find that knowing and being never for a single moment, separate. When that becomes obvious, the, the world is experienced as an expression of ourself. That is, as an expression, as, a, as it were, closer than expression, as a modulation of ourself, as the shape that our very own self takes from time to time, as it were. The world is not out there. The world is in here. In each body, a world is creating daily, momentarily, shaped by our thinking, our programming, conditioning, desire, attachments. All of this flavors and creates a world that is really strongly built out of the psyche, a world of emotion, of feeling, of aspiration, of memories. That's the real world that people are living into. The, the raw material world is just the background. But the world is the world of perception, of interpretation, of dreams, of desire. That's the world of the human being. Sri Ramana Maharshi actually made a beautiful expression, statement, which I so love. He says, the I must remove the I, yet remain the I. In his own case, uh, after realizing the self, he continued uh, to build an ashram and to offer advice to people, varying advice to people, read the newspapers, you know, all of these things. So if there was no world, what, who is he in that, you see? Okay, this, this device of Ramana, it is just another device to come to know whom I. I mean, it is not a magic show to remove this world, <laughs> yes. No, it is, otherwise he say you are not that what you see. 
the world is there as at the moment the eye appears. And then out of this eye, spider, it creates a world surrounded by creation. So consciousness takes all the forms and creating them by simply getting into form. So there's information of consciousness. This is world. And how to remove the world? By being as you are. If, if, if there's self and nothing but self, then there is no world anymore. But that's the only way out. To see there is never, well, there was never any such thing as world. That world is in its essence consciousness. And consciousness is all there is. And even that to be that is what is prior to consciousness. Because consciousness is your absolute realization, but you are not your realization. You are that what is realizing itself through consciousness. So the world just comes and it goes. I don't have to destroy the world. I don't have to end the world. It's quietly, easily enough ending from one moment to the next without me. It's been suggested that the mind must be destroyed for liberation to occur. Do you have a mind and how to destroy the mind? <laughs> well, what is it? I mean, what is a mind? I haven't found one. We cannot find it because it's, it has no substance. It's just arising for a millisecond and falling away. Every thought that arises, our name, for example, if we repeat our name, Torsten or Pramananda, Padma, how long is it there? You know, it's just And what just substance is it made of? It's like, what's the reality of it? If Ramana Maharshi has said that, I would say, okay, perhaps since he didn't speak English, the translator has translated mind. Ramana Maharshi perhaps said, avidya, ignorance has to be destroyed. And the translation was mind. If anything has to be destroyed, it's avidya. And avidya, ignorance, is a belief that I am a limited consciousness, that I am a body mind, that I'm a separate person. And that's, that's the only thing that has to be destroyed. Obviously, it is the same consciousness that hears the words, that understands them, that feels the feelings in the bodily sensations, and that perceives the world outside. Now, when it is said that mind has to be destroyed, no, only perhaps a part of the mind will, will vanish. But there is a practical aspect to it. Does it mean that after having realized your true nature, you're no longer able to understand or to speak English or French, that you are not able to drive your car, that you are not able to read? Obviously not. Ramana Maharshi had glasses and he would read. So obviously, this part of his mind was not destroyed. So what is, what is destroyed is the, all the belief systems, and by the way, feeling systems, that uh, have something that, that, that hinged upon the belief that I am a separate consciousness. Yes, of course I have a mind. I mean, this, 
you know, there is definitely a misunderstanding about the destruction of mind. Of course, the mind cannot be destroyed in its, in its essence. The mind can be destroyed and has to be destroyed in its, let's call it, you know, overlayer, its idea of being a separate entity. Um, the mind is responsible, Ramesh calls, calls it the working mind. This is also a very important differentiation, which makes clear that the mind has not to be destroyed. Thinking mind has to be destroyed. The working mind is not only important, it is absolutely essential for this body-mind organism to work. When the working mind uh, doesn't, is, is, is dead, this organism is dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So of course I have a mind. And the mind is, is great. I mean, the, the essence of mind is pure intelligence. I don't have a mind and um, so I can only speak from experience. There is a concept of a mind and that concept of a mind is like a vast container that is housed inside each head and inside that container called mind resides all the memories, the hopes, the fears, the desires, the anxieties, the everything. In, in order to destroy the mind, we first have to find it. So the mind is, is considered to be like a poisonous snake that is ruining everything and that we want to kill it. So we go looking for this poisonous snake, but nobody has ever seen the poisonous snake. So no one has ever experienced a thought or a mind inside the head, or a thought inside the mind. The mind is simply a thought. The thought, what should we have for dinner, doesn't appear inside another thought called mind. One thought cannot appear inside another thought. It's about seeing clearly, experiential understanding, not intellectual understanding, experiential understanding. That is what is referred to as the destruction of the mind. Seeing clearly that it is absolutely non-existent in the first place. I, as far as I'm concerned, there is no such thing as a mind. There is only thought. A thought, a thought, a thought. So thinking still apparently continues, which is being arising as thinking. For me, it's the seventh sense. Thinking. The seventh sense. It's the sense. seventh sense. There's the five senses, the sixth sense of feelings, and the seventh sense is thinking. There's nothing wrong with thinking. Right. It's not the enemy of enlightenment. It is simply something that happens within the whole. <clears throat> Right. So after liberation, thinking still happens. It gets a bit bored because there's no one listening. We were saying before that you're, you, you think less. Well, I don't think less, but thinking happens, but it's lost its power because there isn't anyone that it can overpower. Right, right. Thinking, you know, prior for the seeker, very much speaks to the individual, and the individual respects a lot of what it thinks. So you don't have goals in your life, which the mind then tries to pull you towards, for no, example. No, we don't have anything. Right, right. Liberation is total poverty. It is the poverty of there being no one. Therefore, nothing is any longer owned. All there is, is this reality. All there is, is reality. And it's a mystery to me that anyone thinks that part of that, uh, this reality is something that's evil that has to be cut out and destroyed. It's a mystery. How can it be? How can there be that? All there is is being, and if the, if the mind or the thinking reacts or works in a certain way, then that is what is happening. And there is no one, no seeker, no one, who 
There is no one who can change that. What about the tendencies of the mind? Must these be removed before self-realization can become permanent? And how to remove the tendencies? One could say, the cause which stops me from realization are the tendencies. If I remove the tendencies, the liberation will come. So the cause is the tendencies, get rid of the tendencies and the liberation will come. Oh my God. It could take one hell of a long time. If, however, I look at myself, the self, where it lands, and I say, my God, I've got incredible tendency to be, tendency to be really judgmental about other people. I've got a real tendency to keep putting myself down and feeling I'm no good and I'm worthless. And I notice this coming up daily. I don't seem to get a lot of space around it. Or all the other tendencies. Then, I want to address that. I want to look at that. And hopefully come to a bit more clarity and understanding. And one wonders, well, God, I had that tendency. I, now I have some realization. What happened to that tendency? Do the work on the latent tendencies of mind. Do the work, the prayers, whatever, the meditation, whatever has to be done. And in the same moment, be open to, to realize truth. You know, while you deal with untruth, be open to realize truth. Many people who have gotten in touch with Advaita, they have not realized what I call, you know, the paradox path. Some people say, we have to prepare ourselves and it's going to happen in the future when I'm mature enough. Other people who have the same linear thinking, but just on the opposite way, who have misunderstood Advaita, claim every preparation is senseless. Don't do anything, don't do your work, just sit there and know who you are. So this is just the opposite direction of the same linear misunderstanding, uh, which is also a typical masculine uh, idea, you know, of a, a mind that has lost uh, its uh, female roots, which is, by the way, I mean, this is a general illness of the Western mind, you see. The, the, uh, has to do with the Christian patriarchs that have been uh, coloring the whole Christian teaching. So this is a general illness, not only in men, but also in, in Western women. You know, the thinking process is, 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 uh, is masculine, you know. I shouldn't postpone the question, who am I? I mean, I'm, I'm open for this question in any moment, any given moment. And at the same time, you know, I do my work. You don't have to do anything. What you have to do, if you like, is to have a moment of self-realization. If you realize the self, these structures disappear by themselves. So 
I would say that there's no need to remove these structures. And certainly in my case, I didn't remove all the structures. My own experience 18 years ago was that out of this self-realization, out of the uh, dissolving of the attachment, there was nobody left to hold those structures, to hold those ideas and concepts. And so basically they ran out of energy. They just simply ran out of energy, dissolving into the blue sky. And so I would say the movement inside Premananda in the last 18 years has been a movement towards um, a deeper and deeper sense of emptiness or silence. Self-realization is not, again, is not a temporary experience of bliss, but it, it is a dissolution of ignorance. The, the vasanas remain as, as but they, are, they have been deactivated by self-realization. Uh, but what they do is that they, pre they prevent the true seeker who has been liberated and has become what in India they call uh, Jivan Mukta through the liberation. They prevent him from enjoying for a while completely the fruit of his understanding, of his realization, of his liberation. Well, they don't have to go, but they have to be able to be let go of. They don't have to disappear. I doubt they can never disappear. Yeah, I think they are ingrained in, you know, so that as soon as you start to function in, in time and space, in the world with other people, then they're, they're going to be the instruments through which you, you communicate and express yourself. You know? So I think that, I mean, the, the tendencies, as you call them, they seem to be the mind's influence upon our activities and, and what we choose to do and who we choose to be with and so on. And, and these tendencies are part of who you are in the world. But as I was saying, when you're in that space, you're not in the world. So you don't have any tendencies and you don't need any tendencies. about destiny? Do you expect things to simply happen or are you expressing your free will and choosing? Yes, free will. Where does it arise from? How do you decide what you want? I mean, there's a strong feeling in the West, I think, that if you don't decide, nothing's going to happen. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but there, there is another way of really experiencing life, which is decision arise of their own. It does not mean that not, no decision arise. Maybe a clear yes or a clear no arises in the, in the mind. It's not me that, that produces this yes. There is an intu, intu, intuition yeah, where it comes from. In a way, the less I'm doing, the more happens. Yeah. yeah. The, more, the more clarity there is, yeah, the more creativity in a way also Mm. You know, that things come just out of the blue. But I think this is very hard for many Western people mm. because we are so much conditioned yeah. to do something. Yeah. You know? yeah. So to go from doing something to relaxing into allowing mm. things to happen, 
It's a big step for many yeah. people. And in a way, it seems like this, this concept of an individual, separate me is so much more strongly developed in the West. It is, it is, it is a sh challenge because there are often, what arises often, there is fear. Yeah? Oh, mm -hmm. when, I, when I do not decide how will I live, uh, there is the possibility of self-inquiry. Really, I would say like Ramana, and I think Ramana, again, is such a good example for distrust, you know. Mm -hmm. When you read about him, you, you find that it is said that he never asked for anything. Destiny. I, I personally, I say destiny, nobody knows. I mean, if you actually look at destiny, it is more like a logical conclusion, I would call it, it is a philosophizing. Yeah, so long you're on the path, you can say, okay, I'm not the doer, you know. I am not, I'm, I, I do not do that. It is all just to happen. Higher power, it's like higher power, you know, higher power is moving this cup. I'm not doing, I'm not the doer, you know. On the path, you say, yes, I'm not the doer, you know. I'm not the doer. I didn't do it. It just happened, you know. I didn't do, you know. Who you refer to when you say, I'm not doing, to whom you refer to? You still refer to this body, mind, organism, yes, because you do not know who you are. Whatever, whatever you may do, choose or not choose, still it needs to be done. You have to move things, you naturally, if it is destined, it is so irrelevant. Still, you need to be there to do so, isn't it? It is irrelevant. It is not, it is so easy, misunderstood. I have heard, oh yes, don't worry, uh, you don't need to do anything about enlightenment, just stop the search. It is anyhow destined if you're going to wake up or not. There's nothing for you to do, you know. And, you know, and wait till higher power is going to lift up the ass. <laughs> Who is the master? What is the master's role? And how to recognize a true master? You can only have one master. You just when you you know when that happens, there's you know I've 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 I've, I've sat with a few other uh, masters, and uh, I can say that uh, you know it's it's they've all enriched my life, no doubt. You know, right. there's only one master. Right. There's only one master. You know. Being with the Master in personal form is the most radical, the most clear, and the most obvious way of approaching the truth internally. And it's, it's the way that works. You know, everything else um, doesn't really work for, I would say, at least 99% of the people. It just feels good, I think, for, as a human, it feels good to be able to direct the love to a certain point, you know? It's easier somehow. And for me, it, I was really interesting when I felt that, that I had directed my love to the Divine, to this one dot, Osho, you know? <laughs> I thought enlightenment has to look exactly like that. That for me was a bit of a trap I was in for a while, that it has to be graceful, it has to be beautiful, it has to be intelligent, it has to be um, so vast, you know, like this genius guy, you know. But I think that's the thing with Amas, and I think that's a, a, it's a point, is that Osho wasn't what we projected either, but he, he helped us, like, it, it was like, 
that when you pr- you know you project your love and then you actually find there's nothing there and when you actually completely dissolve into the meeting of that thing that you've been being seduced to come close to there's nothing other than who this moment you know and i think that so shows that was any master's job once that happens job is over the true master the ultimate master is your own self your own intuition so if you have a connection to yourself then the master on the outside becomes unnecessary but for most people we're so identified you know we're identified to be a somebody and therefore we need a, a living somebody on the outside some people have this idea that if you become involved in a spiritual master you are if you like surrendering to another human being and therefore you're making yourself somehow you know less and you're making yourself um susceptible to some kind of abusive situations that's not a true master and a, a true master would never work in that way a true master wants you to realize that you are the same he is the self and you are the self everybody is the self we're just we're all the self it's all one processes might need hundreds of years and you know with the proximity of a personal master this time is is suddenly melting hundreds of years can melt into a few years or finally even into no time I think it was a nice idea of Krishna Murti, you know, um, to teach people to focus on the inner authority and to focus on actually the inner teacher. And what I can reply to this idea is it's a nice idea but it's not in relationship with um with the observation with the natural scientific observation of um generations of of seekers i think this is a you know a present the, the present of a western teacher is that a western teacher can teach western people much better than anybody else i think that some indian teachers they 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 don't from an absolute point of view it's all the same but in the teaching there is it's not only about the absolute it's about you know what i call the marriage between the absolute and the relative so advaita is not really interested in that um but i i am more and more So there are no gurus. Right. Uh, there is no role because if there was a role it would be imply that there is a path. There is no teacher because if there's a teacher that would imply there's something to learn. How could I teach anybody to be? How would I teach anyone to be, to breathe, to see, to feel? That's all there is, being. So uh, my sense is that this this is the hidden message and somewhere when there's a readiness to hear it and it's not anybody's readiness it's just readiness it will be heard and it does, it's absolutely not necessary for anybody to go and hear it from anyone else the, you know the liberation happens at, despite us not because of us i mean gu- the word guru somehow means the one who brings light to the darkness Mm. which is not so bad i mean it's no, actually it's all, quite all, a nice function really absolutely but the mind does construct a thing about the idea i mean we sit the audience is here i stand there and immediately the idea is that i'm going to tell them something 
Right. You know, that whole setup is that I've got something they don't have. What I actually tell them is that actually I've lost something. Traditionally, devotees had tremendous devotion to the master. Please say something about devotion in the pursuit of awakening. It's humble and it's kind. It's a broader way. So it is very important that this understanding happens in the heart. And devotion really is a safe way. Even the masters will say that Although, even with the non-dual teachings, they will tell you, if keep inside your heart an attitude of gratitude, it will, it will protect you from arrogance which will make your path slippery. You see? So this feeling of uh, uh, giving thanks for all that helps to remind you of who you are is uh, very important both for the bhaktas and for the, the jnani types. So devotion I put very, very, very high Sometimes people who come more from an intellectual background tend to look down on people with bhakti to feel like they're very naive and very quick to give away their trust to others and so on. And they themselves are so tied up sometimes in their own sort of self-reliance that they don't really evolve into the heart. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> devotion is at the heart of it. And devotion is sweet when mixed with wisdom, you know, beautiful, <clears throat> strong and soft. And then also the intellect can be strong and clear, but also soft with the warmth of uh, devotion and love. Beautiful. Then it fulfills itself. Jnana fulfills itself. Uh, wisdom fulfills itself with love. And love fulfills itself with wisdom. You see. Mm. What, what am I devoted to? I, I, am, I am devoted. I know that. I feel it. And there's no question. But I don't... I, I can't really separate the physical from the unphysical in a way. There's some part of me that bounces between loving to see his face or so, you know. And if you look at that picture of Ramana, All right. it emanates. If you look at a picture of Osho, it, there's an emanation happening, you know. I always feel this feeling when, when, when I sing, it's th that feeling of thank you so much, you know, like I can't. I don't, I can't, I, it's too much to say, you know, and I can, I can sing that thank you and it's, it's the best I can do to express it. And it's also a, a, a fill me up, you know, with, with you, you know, you, you know, so it's this, and I, I feel that's devotion, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a circle actually, you know, it's not just a one way you know, energy going, energy of love and, and acceptance and, and um, but it's also an openness for that to come inside of me. Well, you said you were devoted to me. Can we talk about that? He's <laughs> 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 got it on tape now. <laughs> Devotion has something to do with love, that you really feel in a way connected to, to a human being, to your master maybe, yeah? that is really transcending all, all the other ways of, of love, for example romantic love, you know, that often our, our belief system in the West is really to, to love someone is only possible in, an, in maybe in a family or especially in a romantic love relationship. And this is so limited, you know. And if you really somehow you somehow feel feel a devotion to a master, a spiritual teacher, it can be so opening. There can be so much love. It can be even more intense than to your married one. I have seen many people they're stuck with this love business. You know, it, they never wake up. You have to come to a point 
when you don't care about love, you just want to rather go along what is true, you understand, rather to desire what you will never get, only frustration, isn't it? A master can't give you love, you know, can't give you, can only introduce you that you are love, you know. Love is never given and it is not even received, you know. It is triggered, you know. There is nobody there to own love. The two paths of, of um, knowledge and love are well documented in the spiritual traditions. The path of jnana and the path of bhakti uh, are well known. But there is a third path, the path of beauty, which is very rarely spoken of. So in the same way that we may listen to a, a dialogue or a conversation that expands the teaching, and this will dissolve the mind in understanding. On the way of beauty, it's just done through the senses, just through perceiving. It's not, it's not a, a mental process. So beauty is, is again another name for the taste of our own being, the knowing of our own being. Seekers often have curious ideas about the enlightened state. Please describe your typical day and how you perceive the world. Actually, there is no difference when I was 10, 5, 1 year old. There is deep sleep and out of the deep sleep there is some whatever awakening into some sensation. And then out of, out of the sensation some day by day action happen. Where teeth brassing or whatever. It's a normal day. But never with a sense of doing it. That's the main point. It's an absolute functioning in itself. Without any it's an automatic. So it's the same as always. Simply without the sense of me doing it. There's a lot of bliss, so in that sense something is special or something is different from before. So I can do perfectly without that what, what one would call bliss. I would never swap it from that what is the peace of the self, to be that what is. Because this is the absolute peace. Be that what is peace. Totally in peace with oneself, by being that what is. It's so sweet, isn't it? <laughs> well, if I could tell you what I have for breakfast and where I am, what time I get up, they could all do the same thing. You know? It's so. But I mean, this is an, an also a very common thing, yeah, that, that one projects onto this person who is standing having meetings that they must be living in a very special way yeah. and very special things are happening to them. Yeah. You know? Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm not a master. Right. Obviously, if I was a master, I would be someone who's mastered something. All right. All right. I'm a loser. I'm a total and utter loser. <laughs> With twinkling eyes. <laughs> Everything is as it is. Uh, there is no um, desire to push things about. Eyes open. Images are perceived. Everything is happening by itself. Mm. My day, mostly I hardly notice it. I hardly notice it in terms of events. What is my day is full of silence and peace. Everything arises spontaneously. There is no abiding sorrow. There's room for everything. Every emotion, every thought can come, but they have no real landing place to stay. Everything is a tourist, comes and goes. 
the one who is claiming to be the doer drops off and just activities arise by themselves. But inside this, the core of it, there is something that is indefinable. On my typical day, I, I will have breakfast and I will play the flute. If the weather permits, I, I play some tennis. I hang out with friends. I, uh, I cook for uh, my wife. I spend some time with my family, with my wife, my children. I enjoy nature. Sometimes we travel. Uh, and sometimes people come and ask questions. You know, the beauty is not that there are something that are extraordinary, but the beauty is that that which was taken to be ordinary is in fact extraordinary, that everything is extraordinary. Everything, celebration is every moment, that, that's a mission of life. Mm -hmm. Once you have set aside the, the, the concerns of being a separate entity, then what else is there to do as, having a, as to have a good time, you know? And in, in general, um, I don't think there's anything particularly extraordinary about the way I pass my days when I'm not in seminars. You know. I think for the people who, who are in the team, then I think being here without me doing anything other than I've described is in some way extraordinary. And I, and I think when I'm not doing anything, but everybody's gone into this incredibly deep space and they can't eat and they can't move, and I wait and wait, and then, then I have to get up and go, because I know if I don't, they sit there for the rest of the evening. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, they won't be able to move. It's not that they're respecting me, it's that they're, they're, in, they're in the space. When you would meet someone with a passion for awakening, what would your short advice be? Your passion is your awakening. They are not two separate events. Love the passion. As much as possible, leave your intentions aside. Leave what you think you know aside for a moment. Just be, just be here for now. Let's see what happens. The first thing is that we are in silence together and that we somehow look in the eye if there is an openness and there is something which is before the words. There is something which is already, already there. The silence. And then yeah. honesty, of course, is always a very useful ingredient. In the honesty, everything that seems to get in the way gets revealed and gets seen through. Sitting totally quiet, making no effort, and out of this effortlessness, an effort of a question pops up, and this question alone, there was an answer. That is that what is called bliss, maybe. Being the laziest under the laziest. Never doing anything. I mean, the reality here in the West, it may be different in the East, but in the West, the basic energy in the society is not really supporting somebody who has a passion for awakening. Um, I would say that if I would meet such a person, and luckily in my daily life I meet lots of such people, then in any way I can, I would give them support to continue their passion. 
Well, I think most people are not interested. <laughs> <laughs> well, there would be no advice. Right. Uh, if you if, if you like, uh, uh, I would say to them: until your life is lost, you'll always wonder why. But there is no advice. I can't tell anybody to do anything, or look at anything, or see anything. There is no one. I don't I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. No, I really don't know. I, I, I feel like a, a happening. <laughs> you feel like a happening? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until recently, it would have been necessary to travel to the East to have access to these profound teachings. Nowadays, we can view European masters presenting these ancient teachings on the World Wide Web, or we can attend a satsang meeting in our own town. In this European spiritual masters film, these teachings which have been passed down through generations of masters, bring us the means to live spontaneously, peacefully, and joyfully. There are 14 answers to each question, which you can fully enjoy reading in the companion book. But if I look at the answers, there is a thread that goes through the whole film, which is like the teaching. I would like to thank all the European Masters and my colleagues who have supported the original inspiration to create this film. Basically, just really happy, you know. I was just really What's wrong with it. <laughs> just happy. How dare you say that? You were happy all the time. <laughs> it's one of the worst things you could possibly say. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> well, as long as I do what she tells me. Oh, okay. <laughs> which is all the time. <laughs>